Hey folks, welcome to Back to the Roots podcast. Just wanted to give a quick heads up before this episode that we've got a lot of background noise um, because we were actually at the Kentucky Organic Feed Mill that we reference in this episode. And the construction that we talk about was actually happening in the background. So there's a lot of extra banging and an angle grinder going um, that adds to some of the background noise that we normally try to avoid. So just wanted to give an apology and hope you still enjoy it. Thank you for listening. You're listening to Back to the Roots podcast. And today, Mike Klein and Brian Wood are joined with uh, Melvin Troyer from Kentucky and also John Cameron from Kentucky. Uh, Melvin is a dairy farmer uh, in western, is it Hopkinsville? Yeah, uh, been, uh, Guthrie. Uh, Guthrie, Melvin. Kentucky. And he is also involved with the coffee feed mill, which is Kentucky Organic F- Farm and Feed. Farm and Feed. Uh, so today we're going to talk about kind of the history of your farming operations, transitioning to organics, and then how it's going uh, with the feed mill here. So thank you for joining us, Melvin. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background on where you got your start uh, in dairy farming? Well, we've, I've been on dairy farm ever since I remember. Yeah, I guess I was milking since I was 10, doing chores since I was 5. But uh, we were very much a conventional dairy, push-oriented and um, well, I worked for Dad, and then went in partnership with him. And in '98, um, we were in the top five in the state for production. Um, we uh, everything should have been going good, but it wasn't. We got yonis. Oh. And we were a closed herd, so we didn't think we got, we should get yonis, and we, so we didn't really pay attention to what yonis was like. And um, <clears throat> we had. Maybe, maybe it was about 96, we had one cow looking back. We know what it was now. We didn't at, at the time. In 98, I think it was, we had two. And 99, we had like five. Well, this time this got our, got our attention. We got to vet out and started um, checking, see what was the matter, what it was. Well, we found out it was Yoni's. By 2000, we had uh, lost half of our heifers to Yoni's. Heifers to Yonis. Yeah. Wow. Plus cows. I mean, these were cows that went clinical that we had to get rid of before they died. Mm-hmm. Um, then in, uh, <clears throat> let me see, we started testing, and 62% of the herd had Yonis uh, positive or suspect. Of course, that didn't pick up the ones that were in incubation. And we didn't know what to do. I mean, we thought we couldn't conscientiously sell the herd. And uh, the beef, it would have been a huge loss, so we decided to dig in and see if we can get out of here. Um, Before you go too far into that, can you just explain yonis and what the effect on a cow would be? (laughs) The effect on a cow is she eats like crazy and she starves to death. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just runs right through her. It goes right through her, and she's, uh, uh, I guess the... um, Oh, oh, it's been so long since we've dealt with it now, but I, I couldn't, can't explain exactly how it works. But anyway, the gut is no longer healthy. It's, it's has, I don't know, it's scar tissue or what, but it doesn't allow the cow to absorb the nutrients, so they go right through. And she, like, yeah, she eats, she, she'll eat, but she starves completely to death. She'll, she'll waste away to nothing and just have water, diarrhea, and it's not a good feeling. And, and typically uh, that... The way I understand it is that can lay dormant for many years, and mm-hmm. then it, it typically shows up mm-hmm. in older cattle. Typically, and you were seeing it in the year and a half olds, yeah. two year olds. We even had a couple, uh, yeah, two year olds, but we even had a couple that uh, broke before they calved the first time. Wow. So looking back, I mean, we know now what the problem was. I mean, we thought we were a closed herd, we, and we were, except. Uh, we had um, uh, one of the Lancaster Amish moved down, brought his heifers down, and the barn wasn't ready, and asked if we would milk them. And so we milked them for about three months. This was about four, five, six years earlier. But what happened in the meantime after that, we had a pair of Muscovy ducks fly, come flying by from I don't know where. Um, she laid 15 eggs, and the male disappeared. But the babies were born, and about two two years later, we had a hundred of them. Jeez. 
So we kind of liked them because they uh, they uh, they kept ditches clean. They ate the fly, kept the fly population down. They went through the manure and got all the maggots out, you know, and all that stuff. We we really liked that part. The fly population was really down. But we didn't really think about this we, like we should have. They would go through that manure, and then they'd crawl up in the feed bunk by the cows, spread that manure through the feed bunk. They'd swim through the manure pit, and they'd come up, and they'd crawl up on the calf buckets, and that's where they really got it. They got it as baby calves there. So they were spreading it. It's not going to affect a duck, but they're going to be spreading it on their feed from... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jeez. Wow. So all the ducks had to go, and we had to do, well, we had to buy, we bought 15 cows, heifers, uh, because we didn't have enough young stock ourselves. Uh, it was the first time we had to buy calves, buy, buy replacements. Um, even then, it was, we barely had enough because the cows were dying. And, but we knew we had to do something different. We started testing twice a year for yonis. Anything that was, was clinical, of course, had to go. Um, <clears throat> we'd separate the calves as soon as they were born. Um, only They only got colostrum from cows that were cl- tested clear. Uh, cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. You know, we had to about make a hospital room for the calves. But um, the state vet, oh, well, back up. We... Um, we thought, well, Dad Dad thought, Dad was the one to come up with the idea. He says, I wonder if we did rotational grazing, get the cows out in the sun, get their exercise, if the cows that are, and also drop the production a little bit, uh, if the cows that were, um, what's the word? Um, yeah, the, the, the ones that the are cows a carrier? that were, were positive but not, Clinical. Not clinical. Okay. If they would go, because we couldn't sell all the positive cows. We <laughs> didn't have any cows left. So we thought that maybe if they went out there and, and, and got their exercise and the sun and all that, and that, that maybe they would go longer until they went clinical. And um, that seemed to happen. I mean, it, it did something happen. They went longer. We even had one or two that was positive that eventually cleared up. And that's, they, the vet said that doesn't happen. And um, they sent uh, the state vet and Dr. Britt and some of the university people down to go through and see why we're, why we're cleaning up this fast. They said it would take a minimum of 10 years. It took five. And so anyway, we were rotational grazing. And then the, the, the uh, organic opportunity came along. And we're like, uh, we're halfway there. I mean, what's keeping us from going? Mm-hmm. What year so, was that when organics first started showing interest here? I think it was 2006. Because there were two producers here, Marlon and Irvin, that uh, were, I would don't guess you would say organic by default, but they, 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 they didn't have any inputs. Marlon was very interested in it anyway. I guess Irvin was too. But uh, they didn't have any, any they were... They were uh, rotational grazing, not raising crops. They were had a very much a grass-based dairy, and didn't have any um, anything on the ground that would keep them from going organic. When they had the opportunity, they could go right away. So then, they were on the truck a couple of two years before anybody else came. Organic Valley came in, and they started having these meetings, and interest picked up, and and we were also, you know, from those that were interested in. Uh, Eventually went with the flow, and uh, no, were they going. with Organic Valley from day one? Mm-hmm. Okay, there were about half a dozen companies that would have liked to get our business uh, the, the initially those first years, but Organic Valley had the way by far the best infrastructure. They didn't always have the best price, but it looked like they were the most solid company to us, and we're glad we did it. For example, huh? What year were, did you actually officially come on the truck yourself? Okay, I came on and uh, I guess I did watch it for a year before I made a commitment. <laughs> so I, I Tire came kicking. In, yeah. So I, I came on and I could have come on in the fall of 2009, uh, but uh, 
Actually, I could have come, come on in the summer. You want to hear that story, too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. I could have come on in, in the summer of 2009. And, but to get my transitional feed fed up, I thought that, well, we'll, we'll wait until the fall. Of course, transition, the, the third year transition would have started in 2008. Anyway, <clears throat> I was talking with Jake. Yeah, everything's fine. We've set a date for October 1st to start. Everything's fine. Two weeks beforehand, yeah, everything's set to go. We're just, everything's fine. And uh, October 1st comes. Uh, here comes the phone. Hello, um, 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 Melvin, I got, I got bad news. Uh, of course, you remember 2000, September 2008, what happened. I mean, the economy crashed. And, and um, so uh, he said, he's got bad news that he can't take us after. I said, what? You can't what? <laughs> he said, I can't take you. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sure that we can take you just shortly, but not, not right now. They won't let me. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well... You know, the economy crashed and everything, and everybody's scared. He, I don't know, he had a long row about what all was going on. Not Jake. Yeah, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, I was just, what in the world am I going to do? I mean, I'm, I'm already over, over two years into it, you know. So I just didn't know. I, I, I just sat back and waited a little bit and talked to my wife about it and, and was so discouraged. I thought about just throwing my hands in the air to forget about it all. And then um, we got to, well, in the meantime, we harvested our corn, grain, and I did a little bit of figuring, and that year I could have sold my, of course, I couldn't that year because it wasn't organic yet. It was third-year transition. But uh, I, if it was organic, I could have sold that corn and bought conventional fed my cow, to feed to my cows and turned over $66,000, just, just like that. So me and my wife were talking, I said, you know, this is about November when we, I mean, when the corn was in, in October, but we got, came to November and, and we were talking of what we were going to do and I finally got kind of excited about that said, you know, I could keep the ground organic. If I don't and I ever decide to go back, I got three years to go. Mm -hmm. But I could keep the ground organic, raise organic crops sell them, buy conventional, feed my dairy cows, and I think we can roll like that. And we got kind of excited about it, and we just that day we decided that's what we're going to do, and we were, we were getting excited. Here comes the telephone. Melvin, I got good news. I can put you on after all. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, they, 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 I think they kind of made it an exception or something to still get me on because I was with it all along, you know. And I said, well, oh, okay. I don't remember exactly how the conversation goes because it kind of blew my mind. But um, we talked about it a couple of days and finally decided, okay, yeah, I think if we have the chance, we better take it. <laughs> so we did. Signed a contract now December 1st instead of October 1st, where we could have June 1st or July 1st before the, the fall of the economy and we would have been all the way up there. We get started there not long. We find out that we're going to be put off 60 days. So now we've got a 14-month transition instead of a 12. So this gets all exciting again. And those are the two high months of my production. It cost me $25,000 just in the difference in pay price. <laughs> those <Ouch>. two months. <laughs> and by that time, Organic Valley was almost stinking. <laughs> but... Having said that, I like to look back at it and, 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 and laugh because it is funny, and uh, I'm glad I did it. Well, well it's partially <laughs> funny because you're now on the truck. Yeah, <laughs> because I'm now on the truck. And, and your story right now is, a, is very important uh, considering the, the market uh, that we're looking at right yeah. now um, and the new folks coming on experiencing a lot of the same experiences that you had. Yeah, I see that. Um, Talking about other companies and higher prices, of course, you won't see that right now, probably. Probably not. No, not really. But uh, going through the tough times like right now, there was a company, I guess I won't name it, 
but there was a company that called me a couple years ago and uh, they were wanting to come down and have a meeting. They had like three dollars a hundred weight higher prices. And um, so they wanted to, basically they wanted the Kentucky group. And I told them that, um, you know, that's okay for now, but Organic Valley's been good to us. They've, got, they, they've helped us along in all kinds of different ways. And um, I don't think it's worth your drive down here because we're not going to be looking at it. We just, for the long haul, we think we're where we want to be. And he thanked me and hung up, and I never heard anything more from him. But this last, uh, oh, I guess it was in last May, I was up in Illinois uh, at a wedding. And it wasn't Arthur, but there was a guy from Arthur, Illinois, was there at the wedding. And he was asking me about organic and all that. And um, then he said that his community uh, received a letter, the organic producers received a letter last week saying that they got 30 days and then uh, they won't have a market. And I asked, well, who are you shipping milk, milk to? And it was this very company that had mm. tried to get us. And I said, hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of those stories coming out of those two years ago now when organic milk market was probably at the peak of where it's been in a long, long time, and people were seeing the dollar signs of these other companies coming, paying higher prices, and all of a sudden the market switches back the other way, and stability just isn't there. Yeah. And uh, this, there's definitely some of those people that are now paying the price of that. They might have gone for an extra two, three bucks, but they've lost it all now. Yeah. It's sad, but... Um, just more background on your farm. So you've been organic since '09 or early 2010. Oh, it yes, sounds like early 2010. And how many cows are you milking? How many acres are you on? Uh, 100 cows, about 350 acres. Okay. We've uh, the kind of personal note, I guess, is the I didn't. Uh, to me, the whole steam didn't look like the perfect organic cow, and um, we tried a lot of crossbreeding, different things, and um, finally saw if I, did, I mean, if I don't watch myself, I'm going to have a little bit of everything, not much of anything. <laughs> so uh, we switched to Fleck V, and I'm breeding everything over to Fleck V, and I'm very happy. Really? Yes. How long have you been doing that? Um, my oldest cows. I have four, I believe, from the first year I did it, and they're um, fifth calf this fall. They were the fifth calf cows. Uh, I did it two years, just kind of sparingly to see if I, if, you know, I didn't. I was scared to just jump on, but after two years, I jumped on. So I'm breeding everything over now. I, I don't know. I probably have 80 percent that are that are at least cross, and they're. Averaging 70 pounds with over 4% butter fat and uh, 3, 3, 3, 4 protein, something like that. No, the Fleck so. V isn't quite as big as the Holstein, is it? It might not be quite as tall, but it is stronger. It's really it's, thick. Yeah, it'll weigh more. I've got a quarter <clears throat> Fleck V bull right now that mm. we're going to butcher. Yeah. I, I had one half Fleck V before, and he was all grass grass fed but he was still just a little too fat for us mm -hmm. so we kept this one a bull to try to lean him up but it's a really nice looking mm -hmm. looking animal yeah they are the first year i had them i had uh, those few flat heifers that were in with the others then uh, you looked out across the field and you just saw them i mean they were nice and slick and had good weight and everything and i was in transition i mean coming out through that thing and i was probably sparing the grain on the calves too much and the others were a little skinny but they weren't they were fine mm -hmm. now you're there's there's how many organic farmers in this area in the guthrie hopkinsville communities uh guthrie and hopkinsville and um fairview mennonite older mennonites too I am not quite sure. Probably twenty. Yeah, right around twenty. Okay. Now you have you are 
you farm with tractors. You're Amish, but you farm with tractors. Mm -hmm. Do you have electric as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you have the, uh, like, Menno and the guys that moved in from Lancaster. They, they would be the old order Amish. Right. And then you have the horse and buggy Mennonites here as well. Mm -hmm. Is there is that the three main denominations in the pool in this area? In this in area. The organic farmers in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, there's variations of those three as as we reach on out to okay. like Litchfield and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Willisburg and he, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Is your is your church a high percentage of farmers? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. Probably not as much as what it used to be, but it's it's still a fairly high percent of farmers. And what's but, the land price like in this area? Well, I I bought fifty acres three years ago, bare land for ten thousand an acre. <laughs> now that is expensive, it seems. And uh, I mean, as we were driving out here, we stayed in Hopkinsville last night, and we saw some very large fields and a very large John Deere dealership. And it seems like this is a pretty heavy agriculture area and I didn't realize that coming down and one of the things I noticed as we were coming down not only those large fields but but the red dirt yeah what kind of is that red clay or what is that yeah but it's it's very it's productive yeah it's a lot of people look at that the first time they say Ooh. <laughs> but uh, this is one of the most productive areas in the state okay. yeah it's good ground. So, what kind, of, what kind of production would you get? Uh, like corn ground, bean ground. What kind of um, bushels are you talking? Well, I got about 150 bushels this year organically. Mm -hmm. uh, the conventional people were, were talking like, I mean, I think the average is runs between 180 to 200, but there have been 250, 270, mm -hmm. in very good years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're still trying to, to put it all together organically to get that kind of yield, but we haven't yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Has the has the real estate price increased dramatically over the last five ten years? Yeah. As, so yeah. same as everywhere else. Yeah, I think it's about five or six years ago, uh, maybe seven years ago. I'm not sure. I bought um, thirty eight acres for uh, fifty one hundred, so it's doubled. Basically, in that time. Wow. Mm -hmm. So now, g moving ahead into the feed mill here, where we're sitting, um, what brought up the idea of going into the feed mill business with a bunch of farmers working together? Well, you know, these two Organic Valley farms are the first two farms in the state to be certified. And now we're looking at a group of farmers coming in and uh, joining this, you know, having a, a dairy pool or whatever. So the state of Kentucky has no, absolutely no infrastructure. There's no feed mill anywhere close. I personally uh, did and still do my own grinding with a grinder mixer. And so I would have been okay, but a lot of the, uh, the, the smaller farms, the uh, Old Order Amish farms and they um, didn't. I mean, they, they didn't have their own grinder. They depended on the feed mill. So um, they went after my dad to start a mill. And uh, he said he would, but he doesn't want to keep running it. He'll get it started, but he wants somebody to take it on then in a year or two. And he did. <clears throat> um, that's basically because... We needed something, you know, it was born out of necessity. But um, after two years, I think it was, he was wanting out. Um, it was very, very stressful at that time, being new to the business. And at that time, there wasn't nearly as many options available. The grain wasn't nearly as accessible. And after almost running out of grain for a couple of times, this was... <laughs> Then uh, Organic Valley, okay, we, I forget exactly how, how it all came. We talked about forming a co-op, and um, somehow Menno and Sammy and I got 
voted on that co-op. I mean, uh, voted on to the uh, steering committee trying to form this thing. There were a couple others, too, but uh, we three are still remain. Um, it was finally decided that we would buy Dad out, his, his tractor and grinder, the equipment that he had, which wasn't that much. It was all across the road here, just a little, a little shack, and uh, we were, um, bag feed was filled out of the grinder with the burlap bags and had a twine to tie it shut and there were no there was no such thing as feed tags and we were kind of naive about some of the rules and everything about a feed mill we had no idea <laughs> but nobody came and put us under arrest so we <laughs> kept going um organic valley then agreed to furnish the inventory and we would get paid for grinding it and the farmer would uh pay Organic Valley for the inventory, which is kind of a complicated deal, but we didn't have enough money to put that inventory in. After, what was it, five years or so of that, I'm not quite sure now, then we bought the inventory from Organic Valley, and um, yeah, we, we were growing between 20 and 30 percent, even this last year, I think it was like 35 percent. Um, every year we did we were doing no advertising it was just word of mouth we we started just for our own use these couple of dairies and it just it just exploded from there we had no idea it was going to do this but um, it came and so we tried to grow with it and here we are mm -hmm. building a new mill and wondering if we're Chris, still crazy or not but <laughs> are you are you able to buy local organic grain now has has that portion grown along with the dairies it has um this year for the first time this year it's, it has really exploded this year for the first time we have been able to buy everything as far as corn and beans local we bought uh oh i'm not sure 70 probably between 70 and 80,000 bushels since harvest began. There's probably more than that of corn. Mm -hmm. The beans are still coming in. Corn is too. We've got like 30,000 bushels right around us that people still want to sell. We're about full. We're trying to get moved through so we can take it. Mm -hmm. Now, Which, are, has there been a movement in the grain growing industry with any big guys in this area that are transitioning to organics? Yeah. I mean, it. to be honest, it started with organic tobacco. Mm -hmm. People were looking. I mean, we don't raise tobacco. But um, people were looking at, uh, uh, they had to have some ground to rotate it with. So naturally, if the, if the orga tobacco ground was organic, it had to be for the grain crops too. And here we were, and there was a mill here where they could sell it. Mm -hmm. And after a year or two of that, they said, we like this. And they went out and started actively looking for land, pasture land that was where they sold their cows, uh, CRP land that was coming out. Um, a couple of them are probably doing 500 acres organically. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of organic tobacco grown in this area? I'm not sure what you would call it, or a lot. I, don't, I really don't know how much. Okay. We're not involved in that part of it. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is these that were doing the organic tobacco, you know, they needed a little ground to, to rotate that with. But they liked the grain part so much that they really exploded on the okay. grain part. Or so the CRP ground was looking for corn and bean right. ground, not for the organic tobacco as much. Right. Mm -hmm. But on... For organic tobacco, John, you might know this, do they have to rotate the same as you do with any other row crop in organics? I'm not certain. I want to say they can do two years. Two years. But I'm not 100% sure on Would that. Would tobacco come off in time to go in with a cover crop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Up until, I believe it was last year, there was a pretty good tobacco contract in this area, and I think a lot of folks have lost that contract. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how how that's going, but um, 
Yeah. I think it's I think it's kind of neat how, you know, it took just take the tobacco crop, organically, and all of a sudden, well, you've got to do something with it in the in between, and then they start growing some corn. Mm. Hey, we can do this. Yeah, and it's kind of neat how it's and probably having the mill here incentivized a lot of them to oh, look yeah. at it because you know if there's no infrastructure here okay you hear these really nice corn prices and bean prices well where are those prices mm -hmm. you know now that you have that here this that's huge for not only the dairy guys but for the grain growers as yeah. well melvin how far how far of a reach do you all have as far as your sales go or your sales as far as the sales go it's, we're um we're taking feed to two dairies in Florida. Okay. We got um, um, throughout the state of Kentucky, all the way up to the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, not I mean, in the east northeast of Lexington. Okay. And um, down around Chattanooga, Tennessee, plus a lot of I mean, the dairies in, in Tennessee. We've got there there are two organic dairies in Tennessee, and we feed we feed both of them. And uh, we uh, we've got some customers in Georgia and down in Florida. And that's primarily dairy. Are you getting into any of the? Oh yeah. You know, well, the larger chicken contracts, larger pork barns, okay. or the backyard type folks too. We're going. We're really getting to the backyard. We haven't. We there's as far as I know, there's only two large scale organic. Um, chicken operations in the state which egg innovations and hans and brook farms uh, of course egg innovations has their own mill that they're shipping in they did contact us once to see about uh what we could what we could uh, make feed for them in the state here because of the distance to their mill um at that time we couldn't do it we were we didn't have the scale um, I told them we would talk in, a, in another year, which that year is now up in December. I think it was a year right now. And I guess I ought to call them and see what they're thinking. Well, because your scale is completely changing. I'm, we mm -hmm. can hear the construction happening. Yeah. And we're sitting in the facility, <laughs> the new the new facility where an automated milling system has gone. You've gone, come a long way from a tractor and a grinder to now... An automated milling system with bins outside and everything can you talk a little bit about uh, making the adjustment where you're at and <laughs> once and what what it's gonna look like when this construction is all finished up what it's gonna look like <laughs> I'm not sure I <laughs> know as far as the <clears throat> as far as the tractor and grinder um, let's see we're gonna have it looks like we're gonna have about 3,500 yeah, 3,500 tons this year, which is peanuts compared to, like, wolf. But still, it's uh, it's way bigger than what we started, and we're going 20 to 30% a year, and that's without the chicken contracts. That's dairy and backyard. Um, have some some hogs, but not big-time hogs. Anyway, the uh, believe it or not, we are still grinding with the tractor and grinder. It's uh, sometimes pretty hectic, but uh, we are. As and and um, like I said, we started across the road in a little shack, an old popcorn plant from the '60s. Um, we were looking for a place to expand, and uh, this is a, where we're where we're at now. Was a CPS fertilizer place. Actually, it was a Miles Farm Supply, and CPS bought them out. Okay. Well. Miles had several plants here in the area. CPS did too. They wound up closing this one, and it was sitting here. We approached them about uh, buying it, and they said, "No, they're not interested at all." So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do, and uh, looking at different options. And uh, one day they came by and said that they'd sell it after all. So uh, you know, after a lengthy this was a big company, and it's not like just making an agreement between me and you, but <laughs> after a lengthy process, we finally managed to buy it and um, then slowly transition across the road. I mean, it was so nice because just directly across the road, and we could just do it in steps, however it would 
actually we moved the main office across the road immediately and um, the operations were still over there and then the next thing was we started using one of the warehouses for bag feed and um, then we started putting some of the hopper bottom bins over and, and they put the bagging op operation over and it's just slowly bringing it across until we moved everything across and set a bunch of hopper bins bottoms I mean hopper bottom bins up temporarily so that we could go ahead and grinding with the tractor mixer while we're building this in the meantime another thing we did is Menno Weiler and his boys are building it um, they had absolutely no experience with something like this they're learning as they go and they're doing a good job um, probably uh, I mean just Menno and his boys Menno is on the board too so he's definitely got an interest in saving money for the mill, for the co-op. Um, and he loves finding something for nothing. I miss, I'll add that. <laughs> <laughs> Not for nothing, but, but anyway, uh, with him looking for used equipment, and they have a, a very, they're very gifted in improvising and making it work and still not just having something half shod here, you know, it's, we've probably, they'll probably save us a couple million dollars. Yeah. And this still isn't a, a minor investment, even yeah. with all that savings. No. You know, you're going to an automated milling system, I assume what you're doing is probably getting all the equipment in here and then having somebody come and install the Actually, actual... Actually, they're, install, they're installing a lot of it. They're installing the and computer system as well. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's I mean, uh, they're, 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 they have some help. But yeah, they're doing it. Um, the um, what was I going to say? Oh, there's an Amish guy in a newer Amish. I mean, in the same church fellowship we are. He has a in Crofton. He has a, a crane. The the crane that you see out out here. I didn't notice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not tall enough for the tallest top. When we're doing something at the top of the leg, except we can put up a. Uh, what do you call it? The, the pipe, you know, oh, from, okay. from the from the from the top of the leg to the bin, because we can get a hold of that in the middle mm -hmm. and stick it on up there. You know, it, the crane won't reach the top of the leg, but everything below that we can do with that crane if it's not too heavy. And he's just leaving it here. We're renting it for so much a month. Mm -hmm. That saves a bunch of money too. Because mm -hmm. um, then it's available when you mm -hmm. need it, and mm -hmm. yeah. And we also bought. Uh, a bunch of equipment ourselves when we started so we could do it ourselves have, have what we needed to do it ourselves so this is currently in the process it's in the process it's taking longer like this sure, sure. but we can slowly grow our way into it we, I mean the, 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 the one of the challenges is to as we get closer to the automated mill how can we um, do that and if I would just say, if it does something doesn't work, how can we still use the old system to keep grinding? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. we we have to make so that we can do either or for a little while until we get this thing nailed down. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the the dairies in Florida. How did they find you guys to get feed from? Because you said you didn't do any advertising. Was it just word of mouth? Most of this was word of mouth, except I, we don't do any advertising, but somebody put it, oh, okay. Um, I don't really know how they got our, got a hold of us, but somebody uh, put us on the internet. I don't know, we don't have a website or anything like that, but it, I, I understand, I mean, you know, we don't have internet, so I don't, haven't seen it, but I understand that you can, I don't know, is it through Google or where, but you, can, you put in organic and coffee will come up. Okay. And so I guess, I don't know who did it or anything like that. Is it a pretty big dairy? Yeah. Well, one of them is, uh, he's growing. He, I think he has like 130 cows. The other one is just starting out. And he's, I'm not sure if he's 100 yet, but he's going on up to 200 and something, I think. Okay. Well, and I think what part of what allowed them to find you is the you mentioned the lack of infrastructure yeah it's not just in kentucky between wolcottville indiana and florida 
you are the only organic feed mill yeah. between the, the, I mean, essentially mm-hmm. that is, that is only organic, I should say. There's mm-hmm. others that deal with, with uh, it on the side okay. mm-hmm. and would do, you know, small local bagged feed or if somebody's asking for it in a local area, but mm-hmm. there's just not much organic feed mill infrastructure currently. No, there's not. And that is, that's much to our advantage as far as that goes. But uh, we're trying to remain true to the co-op vision and keeping the price down as far as we can. You know, there's no big, no fat cat sitting in the middle. <laughs> Are you, do you deliver bagged feed? We do, but um, I think we could do a whole lot more of that. We've got, okay, we deliver bag feed with the bulk truck. We've got room for about a little over two tons of bag feed with the bulk truck. So one way that we service the homesteaders is when we, anytime we um, have a run out to one of our dairies, we've got a list, this dairy, we've got a list of homesteaders in his area that we call or email, let them know that um, we're coming and they've put in an order and we take it along and have it drop it off at the dairy or meet them at the interstate or something like that. Mm-hmm. But we we could I think we could move a lot more bag feed if we were to fix up something to deliver it with mm-hmm. on a bigger scale. I I find that really exciting that the backyard yard chicken people and stuff like that are starting to actually feed organic mm-hmm. because in in our area we even have a lot of organic farmers that buy non GMO feed for their chicken is that right and i'm like well, what are you doing <laughs> yeah. but it's i think it's really neat that that because people especially if they have like you brian a half a dozen chickens or whatever in the backyard i mean it's really nice that there's actually a source for organic feed for them Bill, and it's really neat well and to be growing and i'm sure it's not the backyard people that are allowing you to grow at 30 no. percent per year but to have that kind of growth with no advertisement and basically just going to people through a you know hey you're in an area where we deliver feed do you want some yeah (laughs) you know that's pretty phenomenal and i think Mm -hmm. once you get the additional capacity with this new automated facility you're gonna have a whole new ballpark of options that open up to you because yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have that additional you know you mentioned 3500 tons i don't think people realize being mixed with the the grinder tractor and grinder i don't think people fully understand the amount of work <laughs> that really is yeah that's a fun <laughs> that's phenomenal amount of work and time mm. that require is required in this new facility will mm. probably quarter that literally yeah i mean we figured we probably have at least 10 times the volume capacity yep. but we, we we wondered should we really do that but at the same time we didn't want to build something and be maxed out right away either so we decided we'd go ahead and do it and hopefully we're on the right track <laughs> well and i can say from working with wolf and wolcottville in indiana um they built theirs to have additional capacity, just the same way you're talking, and they're already getting close to meeting that. Mm-hmm. So um, that's why I say that the and you mentioned the lack of infrastructure infrastructure being here is to your advantage and growth. Mm-hmm. Once you have the capacity, I think people will will be here looking for it. Now, you were you were saying that a lot of your customers are backyard growers and and i think what you're probably feeding is market farmers wouldn't you say actually yeah you're right there there's a lot of market farmers and also a lot of backyard farmers i mean there's 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 uh, there's both okay but we do have a lot of market farmers yes especially being this close to nashville yeah Mm-hmm. Now, market farmers, you mean people that are selling, uh, you know... Eggs and meat. Uh, okay, at, at pasture raised. Market, at you know, farmers markets. Farmers okay, markets. I see, mm-hmm. I see. Or CSA or something mm-hmm. sure. like that. Are a yeah. lot of these market farmers certified organic, or are they selling, like, organically grown? Organically grown. There's There might be a couple that are, are certified organic, but not many. Mm-hmm. 
to doing mostly organically grown. Well, I, I was I had raised chickens, you know, a couple hundred a year, got them certified. Well, then the slaughter plant that butchered them dropped their certification, so I still couldn't put the USDA seal on it. So I paid for certification and. It really didn't mean anything. Yeah, and it was it was really disappointing because there's only one plant in Ohio that processes poultry certified organic, and it's three hours from me. And I don't think I'm going to take 50 chickens at a time three hours. There so, are actually people who are doing that because the only organic certified slaughtering place that I know of here is up here in um, Fairview, Old Order Mennonite. Okay. Right there. And there are people from uh, way down in southern Tennessee bringing their chickens and ducks and turkeys up here to slaughter. <laughs> but they're not certified themselves. Mm-hmm. So are, are you seeing a lot more interest in on back to the farm side? Do you think there's a lot of growth potential in organic dairy here? Or did we kind of, did the people that were interested are now organic and it's kind of maxed out? I've wondered that myself. I think there, there's a, there would be a lot of interest. Um, there's a lot more interest right now, but the people are struggling. The conventional people are struggling bad enough right now that they don't dare do the transition thing because they don't think they're going to make it. That's kind of what it looks like. There will be a few maybe, but mm-hmm. as of now, I, I don't see a lot of people doing that. And, and if I, the conventional I, prices come back up, why would you want to transition? Conventional's good, right? <laughs> we had a couple of organic people who switched back to conventional when that happened, mm-hmm. and I told them, man, your memory's short. But it got refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Jake telling me about the one guy that went back, and Jake just he just couldn't believe it. Yeah. But there were a couple, and actually at least one, maybe two, who was that other one? Yeah. It's not milking any longer. Couldn't make it. Well, and I think that goes back to being an organic dairy farmer. It's way more than the pay price. Mm. I mean, you have to believe in what you're doing and believe in that you're farming in a way that is going to be better for the soil and you're, it's a better product all the way around. If you're just doing for the financials, Somebody comes in and offers three bucks, a hundred more. You're probably going to jump. Yeah. And you're what you're doing is you're getting away from the roller coaster of the conventional pricing, but you're going on to a different roller coaster where you're taking even bigger risks. Yeah. So, I, I think it boils down to believing in what you're doing, uh, and the ups and downs aren't that bad. Mm-hmm. I'm agreeing with that. They told us that one before we even started and didn't know for sure what they meant but i do now (laughs) Mm -hmm. and and i think brian i think and john we see that uh people you know you can believe as much as you want if it's not profitable people are going to get tired of it Mm -hmm. so people come to organics because they see the stability of the market and they see financially they can do something that interests the future generations Mm -hmm. but once they're three to five years into it all of a sudden, wow, this is actually working, and they start believing in mm-hmm. the system more. But face it, we have to be honest, most people come because of the financial stability. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then they start seeing mm-hmm. yeah. the benefits. Because mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think early on, uh, the people that came believed it. They didn't come for the money, and then... It took years for people to see that, oh, this is not some fad. And so, to me, I don't care why people come. You know, everybody has their reasons for coming. Mm-hmm. But m- I would say most of them end up believing mm-hmm. in what they're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> you got anything else? I can't think of anything. Can you think of anything, John? No, the only thing I, w- I was thinking of is maybe uh, you might want to talk about your uh, venture into compost bedded pack barn. Well, I don't, uh, let's see, what do I want to say about that except that uh, um, that's one of the best things I ever did. <laughs> you went from free stalls to a compost pack. Okay, yeah. We had, uh, um, our barn was built in 1970. 
we moved on to the farm in 88. It was actually built for Guernseys. Hmm. Um, when the Guernsey was still a milk cow. Mm-hmm. When the Guernsey was still a milk cow. It was like, uh, I think the free stalls were, they're only seven foot long. They had no lunch space in the front and so forth. And we, we did have to build more free stalls. So we, we, I mean, that was back in the nine, early 90s, I think. We also built those for space sake at, at uh, seven foot, but we made a lunch space. And, and they did use the free stalls very well, but it was a very highly maintenance. I mean, clean them out twice a day and all that stuff. But then the, the big thing was in the summertime here, it's hot. I don't know about Ohio. I don't think it's quite as hot or as humid. I don't know, but... Yeah, it's not. <laughs> we, uh, I mean, I would put my cows... I mean, I feed my cows... Uh, let me see, how do I say this? When it get, once it gets hot, then um, we make a total mix ration once a day. We feed that while the cows are out in the pasture, which is right after they get milked in the morning. Try to get them out almost by daylight, milked and out in the pasture. Okay, then when it gets real hot, they're back up by 9 o'clock. If it's uh, not quite as hot. They're up by 11. They could they come up on their own. They do have shade back there, and they do have water. We have buried water lines all throughout the pasture back there, and the quick couplers and everything, paddock tanks. But still, they come up, and uh, they would come up and stand in the barn where we were where, that we did the old barn, and um, which had free stalls along the side and a feed bunk in the middle, and it was dark. We had fans and mist water sprinklers in there but and it was fairly cool but they would stand on the concrete the sprinklers would wet them down the fans would cool them off but there they'd be standing in that slop all day long and we would feed them too you know they they they'd, they'd eat that feed bunk was down to the mill so they did it milk well but i had some uh, wart problems and things like that anyway <clears throat> We were thinking about what we could do to make this better, and we just looked around different options and decided on the pack barn. Um, I've got 125 square feet per cow when there's 100 cows in there. Um, they come in. Oh, I didn't finish my feeding thing, which I don't know if that matters, but still, I feed them when they're out. So when they come back in, they have silage there, uh, which gets, um, I mean, they have a TMR there. That gets eaten up by dark. We'll come in about 4 o'clock and milk them. They'll go back out in the barn and finish eating that up. That's done. Then they go out and pasture. In the morning, we bring them up from the pasture and milk them and send them right back. Don't feed them anything. And then come back and then they'll eat you know, while it's hot. Mm-hmm. That's our summer routine. But now they come up and they're on that bedded pack where it's dry we don't have water. I mean, we do have. We've got water troughs. We don't have fan. We don't have misters. We do have the um, fans and alleyways, and we've got the big paddle fans in the middle. Twenty thousand dollars worth of fans in there. So it's you know it's that. But the cows lay there during the very hottest days. I didn't see any of them pant. They lay there and chew the cud, and they're happy. Really. And um, so. My barn was built as much for summertime as it was as much as it was for wintertime. It's nice in the winter too, as far as that goes. But then, spring and fall, they're in there to eat, and they go out to pasture during the day. Pasture Do you have the, the feed bunk along the side along of the, the side, barn? Yeah, better pack. Mm-hmm. Drive through, or it's yeah, drive through, but it's on the outside. Yeah. On, yeah. What do you call that fence line? Feed? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what do you think it is that? Is the difference between the free stalls and them panting and being hot and crowding up in the... Ventilation. It's just ventilation. It's just ventilation. Um, for, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, we could keep them cool, but they'd have to stand there underneath the misters and fans. Mm-hmm. Here, they don't have to depend on the water to keep them cool. And therefore, we don't have as much mastitis and lameness problems and all that stuff. And if they're, they're laying down on that down. bed of packing, you've got enough square feet 
for one, they're not pushed up against each other right. and just, you know, you see them out and you see them bunch up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, it's 95 degrees. Why are you standing on a pile? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. spread out, let the air flow, but mm-hmm. that's just their nature. Yeah. Um, also, I don't have to put any sawdust in from um, April to November, December. So get into that real quick is how do you... Well, I guess start at the end. When do you clean it out, and then what do you start back with? That's kind of funny. This is the third winter that we've got it, and um, we everything we use is sawdust. Uh, we started with a with a pretty um, thick pack. We've got another got a little thirty five horsepower tractor. Uh, I did put water in the tires so it had better traction and a little kind of a field cultivator behind it. It's kind of half between a chisel plow and a field cultivator. It's an old piece of equipment of some kind, old sea shank thing. But anyway, I can probably pull it that deep. And we go through there morning and night. In the summer, we go through once a day because the cows aren't in as much. So you just try to rip up like the top foot mm-hmm. of it. And how mm-hmm. deep is the okay. pack? Um the pack is now my wall is i think three foot four inches tall and the pack is at this moment probably about halfway up to the top and uh most probably 80 percent of it has never been cleaned out it's the third year did you have to model you said you modified the old freestyle facility or did you build build a new facility we built a new facility okay so you got the sloped concrete so that basically it comes down over that ledge at the front of the pack and then you just scrape out that ledge is that how that works no it's it's not sloped concrete it's It's uh, okay it's it's a it's a dirt floor and it's it's level but what how this works is by by going through with that cultivator twice a day it brings air and moisture mixes it with the dry and it actually composts it down the reason okay i was going to mention about that we don't have to i mean like this is the third year and it's only that much in it um last spring there was more in it than what there is now (laughs) and but by going through there all the time and uh, throughout the summer and not adding more bedding and it still remains powder dry. Then it's composting it down, composting it down, and the the level actually dropped probably a foot hmm. between spring and fall. Mm-hmm. Now it's gaining again because we're adding sawdust. You know, it's coming into the fall and the winter and everything. But and and that's really what we should be doing is hauling that out on the field. Yeah, because that's some high yeah. quality compost of manure there. Mm-hmm. And um, probably we'll do that next year. We we probably be ahead to do it every year, but it was just it was working fine and it was composting on down to a foot deep, and we just kept it in there another year. Now, do you have like where you where you feed? Do you have like a stem wall behind the alley where you feed, or does it just slope up? Oh no, it's a, it's a wall. You've got a wall, uh, yeah, so you've I, got because I've seen some of them where they just have the bed of pack slope down. And then all they do is work that sawdust and stuff down toward the where you're feeding, so you're ending up scraping that out anyway. Yeah. So you've got the wall. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I did. We've got a 250 foot long barn, and we uh, we he hawed about how we're going to make that wall for a long time. But we've got we've got three 12 foot. Uh, water troughs in there i mean of the energy free frost free Mm -hmm. ones they never froze up um that's in line behind the barn i mean behind the wall actually we we poured the wall and recessed it to put that water those water troughs in so that the front is even Mm. the wall has the jag in for that Mm -hmm. um and then we've got, at each end, we've got a 16-foot opening where the cows can come out in the alleyway. And we've got, I think, okay, we've got one, two, three, four. 
I think four, is it seven foot openings? I think along the, mm-hmm. which are those at the at the openings, it's also the wall is recessed oh, you, back, okay. so that not as much of that stuff mm-hmm. comes down into the alleyway, and and that. Jeffrey Bewley from the the compost guru from UK, he didn't recommend all those openings and that wide. He thought they should be narrower. But what that does is it allows me to go through there with the skid steer anytime I want to. And also, if we go in to um, cultivate, or yeah, if we go in to cultivate or go bring the cows, the cows can all through the barn. They'll, I mean, it just. A hundred cows can move out to the alleyway just like that. There's no balling up anywhere. Or if we come in to scrape, they can move back onto the pack, and there's no there's no balling up at any anywhere. Also, we've got a 16 foot alleyway, where um, if you do meet a cow in the alley, there's plenty of room for you and her to pass. I mean, that's to me that's one of the big things. The there's 16 a wide foot alleyway, alleyway. A wide alleyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, any any time where you can keep cow flow without bunching up and pushing and shoving and all that is is worth it Mm -hmm. to me now i've asked other farmers and and i'm going to ask you the same thing have you had any inclination to test the compost in the barn to see what quality i had inclination but that's as far as i got yet (laughs) (laughs) but we want to do that yet when we (laughs) i'd be interested to hear what that Mm. what that is one other thing that i find interesting like i said we we built the barn as much for summertime as for the winter so I was looking at ventilation and war- warmth and ventilation, you know, in summer. Um, of course, for for winter time, there needs to be a curtain. Well, for ventilation, we've got 16 feet from the, well, we've got 13 feet from the top of the wall to the bottom of the plate. A bunch of it's it's tall, mm-hmm. <coughs> and. Um, um, for the winter time, of course, we need a curtain. And I priced a curtain, and it was uh, very expensive. And, but I was trying to figure out how I was going to, whether I going to take have a curtain that comes down from the top and goes back up, and it's up there out of the way in the summer. It's up there out of the way, but it's also up there where it shuts off some ventilation. And also, if it comes down from the top, you got your opening down at the bottom, and you got a cold, stiff wind blowing, it's goes right across the cows or do I come up from the bottom and then in the summertime all that stuff is down there in the bottom bunched together in a perfect place for mice and rats you know and so I didn't know I was trying to figure out what am I going to do we could also do a split one but then then it's even then it's that cuts off ventilation in the summer and it was time to do something and I still hadn't so we came out to the lumber yard and we got house wrap, nine foot house wrap. And uh, we just put it along the side, down at the bottom, up, you know, so I had to still have a four foot opening at the top. Just put two by fours and screwed it into the post, you know, on the outside. Well, on the very coldest day, the cows are comfortable in there because there's no draft over. There. And also it's just along the three sides, the front side is open. And the front side is also towards the south. But um, the cows are very comfortable on the very coldest days. And uh, then in the in the spring, I mean, we put it up in about two hours. In the spring, we can take it down in an hour. We can throw the house wrap away, keep my two befores and screws for next year. And I can buy that house wrap for 25 years for the price of one curtain. <laughs> 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 and to me, it works just as good or better. <laughs> I really like it for having nothing there in the summer. Now you've got a pretty good roof ventilation system as well, too. Yeah, we've got a the chimney type. It's like a, I think a three foot. It's opening. It's three foot opening at the top of the of the truss. The tin only comes. There's three feet between the this tin and this tin. Mm-hmm. But then we've got a a chimney or not a chimney. A, what do you call it? I guess it's a chimney effect, but a canopy across the top so that the weather doesn't come in on the on the um, trusses also it doesn't rain in on if it rains it still goes mm-hmm. off but um, on even with no fans running there's a lot of natural ventilation you it's always breezy it's, you're there. trying to suck the air in mm-hmm. and almost a draw. The top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
We had, uh, uh, we wanted to do a 412 pitch. The flatter your roof, the less it'll pull. Mm -hmm. But um, with the, I think it was in 80, 50, a 86 foot truss, I believe it was. We couldn't do the, we couldn't quite do the four. It's more like three and three quarter. Couldn't do the four because of hauling it on the road. Mm. It was too it would have high. Been too tall. Yeah, too tall. Mm -hmm. Wow, 86 foot truss. Mm. You didn't put those up by hand. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> also, another thing that that I really like, I didn't know for sure how we were going to do it is the defense line feeder or whatever there's a 16 foot or a 15 foot overhang the truss is it's not a lean to the truss was built to have the support 15 inches mm -hmm. uh, 15 feet in mm -hmm. but it sticks out 15 foot with no support on the outside there's no posts or anything in the way but it's far enough where the rain almost never blows in on the feed it's a concrete pad out there where we can mm -hmm. scrape it up and everything is um, a lot of money, but I think it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I want to see that barn sometime. It's the just only, a mile from here. I was going to say, it's not <laughs> far from here. Uh, there, there are some guys that have built compost barns in Ohio, and on the coldest, coldest winter, they have lost their um, <laughs> the heat from the pack. Mm-hmm. And then once that stops composting, you have a swamp. And it happens quick. Yeah. And so they actually almost have to keep the barns tighter and warmer than they want for the cows in order to make sure that they don't lose their the temperature in the pack. Uh, but if they don't, if, if it works absolutely wonderful. Like you can walk around with your shoes on and as long as you miss the soft patties, yeah, I mean, yep. it's clean. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that, you know, there's no new bedding been put in for six weeks or whatever, and it's still clean and dry. It's really neat. And and the quality of your manure compared to hauling slurry is just yeah. a lot better. And it's nicer. It smells better, too. Yeah, yeah. But the, having said that, what you said about that, uh, I know of a couple of people who have put in those big paddle fans up north for winter time where they 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 closed it up you know where it's warmer but then they ran them slow and just to keep the air moving and help keep it dried out it oh, helps keep okay. helps it from that it doesn't go into that state as fast hmm. that's interesting because i'll i'll let people know on that well Good. melvin i think we're going to wrap it up here but i really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us i found it really interesting well you're certainly welcome i don't know i'll say i'm dumb and dutch and don't know much but <laughs> <laughs> well thanks a lot Melvin. i appreciate Thank it you. Melvin.